Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining this month's Leo lecture, short, timely talks that offer innovation and inspiration from Hamlin thought leaders. I'm Betsy Radke from Alumni Relations, and I am pleased that you have joined us today. I'm going to go through a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, for those of you that are new to Zoom, uh, I wanted to go through a couple of items that might be helpful during today's webinar. You are muted and your camera is off. Um, if you do have a question about the logistics of today's webinar, please use the chat icon on your Zoom dashboard. And if you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A icon on your Zoom dashboard. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you can click on speaker view to see the speaker in a larger frame, or you can hide or shrink the thumbnail video on the right as well. And finally, be patient with us as Chris and I are both presenting from our homes. And please know that you could see or hear kids or cats or dogs during today's Leo lecture. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome Chris Norman Major. Chris is a professor and director of public administration programs at the School of Business at Hamlin. She is in her 19th year as a faculty member but her days at Hamlin go back uh, to the time when she was a Piper between 1983 and 87, and she double majored in political science and business administration. Chris's research focuses on cross-sector collaboration to solve society's most challenging issues, as well as social equity, cultural competence, and diversity in the practice of public administration. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to my basement. This is the closest I'm ever going to get to giving a fireside chat. Uh, but I'm really glad that you could join us today. Um, I, I wish we could be in person uh, for a lot of reasons. One, it would mean we're not dealing with COVID-19. Um, two, this is usually a highly interactive presentation. and um, that's hard to do on a webinar. So today you're going to have to be highly interactive at home and thinking about uh, the questions I ask and I'll try to interpret what I think you're going to say um, and respond to that and do the best we can. Uh, the third reason is because usually there's prizes. So you come in person, you get M&Ms. And since we can't do that right now, I have said I've, I promise to protect these, uh, keep them away from my family and save them and bring them to my office so that when we get to the point um, when things open up again, um, stop by my office in East Hall and I will have M&Ms for you and we can talk some more. So uh, that being said, I'm just give me a second here to get my presentation up and we'll get going. All right, so uh, the public good of peanut M&Ms. You're probably wondering what this has to do with what's going on. So here's my first uh, hold on a second. I got it. there we go. So I'm going to ask you to just take a minute and Use your imagination and think back to the days before COVID-19. Maybe that's three months ago or six months ago. And think about what your daily routine was and how you feel it was affected by public policy. So if you think about that and what you go about doing on a daily basis, uh, normally, if we were in person, I would say, well, tell me something you did today that was affected by public policy. And I also usually say, um, you know, just take breathing off the table, because in order to do anything, you have to breathe. And if you are inside, you're affected by clean indoor air policies. And if you're outside, you're affected by air pollution policies. Um, and right now, obviously, with COVID-19, everything we're doing is affected by public policy because it's limiting what we can do and can't do. 
But if you think back to those days before those limitations, what might you have said? Typical examples I get are, um, I woke up. So I will say, okay, did you wake up in a house or an apartment that was zoned as residential, uh, built with building codes to make sure that it's safe? Um, if you are lucky enough to wake up on a mattress, did it have one of those tags on it that said not to be removed except by consumer, which is a consumer safety policy? Um, a lot of times people will say, well, um, you know, I woke up, I hit my alarm, right? Was it on your phone? Your phone is regulated by the FCC and the airwaves or maybe it's an electronic alarm clock and uh, the electricity is regulated by the government as well. And sometimes it's even provided by the public sector. Um, typical one is I got up and I went to the bathroom, right? Um, well, if you live in a city are connected to city sewer, you have water and sewer that's running into your house that's provided by the government. If you are off of the city grid and you have a septic system and a well, those are the well and the septic system are placed according to health regulations so that your water is safe, that the septic system isn't close to your drinking water or your well, and there are regulations about how you place those systems as well. Uh, maybe you had breakfast, right? Do you have to double check or think twice about what you're eating? Or do you have uh, a fairly confidence, a fair confidence in food safety? And the fact that we don't have to worry very often about what it is we're eating. And usually we get warnings when there are problems about what we need to, to watch out for. You drive to work on public roads or you take transit, you follow traffic laws. So the reality is when you think about what you do on a daily basis, there's very little that isn't affected by public policy. Um, when my students and I talk about it, some of the things that come up is uh, students will say, well, I can think. Um, and yes, you can think as long as you don't open your mouth and express your thoughts because expressing your thoughts is affected by uh, freedom of speech laws. And then one of my students pointed out that uh, how we think and what we think is affected by our education. And many of us are products of public schools and public education, so that's also limited. Um, we also talk about, we've come up with basically involuntary muscle movements, um, but if you cough or sneeze, and you do that into your arm, that is public health research telling you about what, how diseases are spread and how to prevent that. So the question is, given all of that, are public servants superheroes or villains, right? How much is too much? You're either gonna think that government plays too much of a role or plays the right amount or maybe not enough, right? Uh, some of you might be thinking, come on, I can't even pee without government having a role in it, right? But maybe the point is, would you want to, right? Would you want to live in a system where there weren't regulations, there weren't sewers, there weren't traffic laws, there weren't other controls that helped us create a more positive, healthy community, right? I usually tell my students that as public servants, they are superheroes and their superpower is invisibility because when things go right, we don't hear about it, right? When things are operating smoothly, we don't think twice about the fact that the public sector is providing our sewer service, is maintaining our roads, is providing our education, 
our public safety. We only think about it when things go wrong, right? When the line is too long at the DMV, when a bridge collapses, when there's some other issue that goes on, when we see the public works uh, people blocking our roads and feeling frustrated about it, right? But in reality, when things go well, it's because we have public servants in the background helping to make sure things go smoothly. So you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I thought she was gonna talk about M&Ms. So let's look at this from another angle and think about it in another direction. So when you look at these peanut M&Ms in particular, what public policies do you see? And this isn't a metaphorical question, you know, like it's a rainbow, it's all sorts of diversity and those kinds of things. Literally, when you think about peanut M&Ms and your ability to purchase them, what is it that plays a role? What public policies play a role in being able to get those M&Ms? So uh, normally if we were together, I would have you shout out uh, your ideas and the kinds of things that you think are involved in public policies involved in peanut M&Ms. Since we can't do that right now, I'm gonna give a shot at what I think you might be saying. So here's some samples of public policies involved in peanut M&Ms, right? Trade policy. Chocolate is not grown in the United States. It is not a domestic product. So we have trade policy in order to get the chocolate. Um, sugar as well is often not produced in the United States. Petroleum, tariffs, all of those policies play a role in the production of M&Ms. There's labor policy. We have occupational self safety and health, OSHA, workers comp, there's minimum wage laws, there's child labor laws, we have laws about breaks, whether or not you can unionize, even immigration policy has an effect on labor, right? And our ability to hire workers who are undocumented or not. There is tax policy, uh, corporate taxes, personal income tax, sales tax, Social Security, Medicaid, property taxes, work, workers' comp. Um, I often note that uh, when I buy these M&Ms for these talks and I use them in class, technically uh, it's an education expense. I, I could deduct that on my taxes. I haven't, I'm not quite that desperate. Um, but all of those kinds of things play a role in, uh, the poli in our policy uh, around these M&Ms. There's transportation policy. So planes, trains, trucks, boats, transit, automobiles, whether it's getting the ingredients to the plant, getting the product from the plant to the store, getting me to the store to be able to buy it, um, all of those kinds of transportation policies play a role in the ability to get the M&Ms. There's energy policy, a petroleum policy, um, electricity, how is it produced? Is it coal, solar, wind? Um, there are plastics uh, you know, in the bags on the M&Ms. The bags are made out of plastic. Plastic comes from petroleum. Um, so those kinds of things all play a role. Environmental policy, uh, pollution control. Uh, the Mars company cannot dump chocolate sludge uh, in the rivers or sewers by their plants. Um, there's other pollution control issues going on with the production and distribution of the M&Ms. Uh, there's food safety. You have a list of the dyes, the contents, the allergy warnings on the package, right? Um, all of those things in order to try to make sure that you can make healthy decisions about what you are eating. Um, even philanthropy philanthropy is involved. The uh, M&M Mars has a foundation, 
It's the Mars Wrigley Foundation, actually. And interestingly enough, it provides uh, money for oral health for kids in countries that provide mint and chocolate, which is kind of an interesting um, uh, fact and, and of that. Um, it also, however, is a foundation that if you look at the rankings, does not get highly ranked as far as its uh, percentage of money that goes out to actual um, causes as opposed to administrative causes. So there's one page for you, but we aren't done, all right? So there's more, right? We're talking about a package of M&Ms. I don't know if you can still see my camera, but a package of M&Ms and we're on page two, right? Um, public health and nutrition. So again, related to food safety, but other questions, you get the information about the calories, the contents, the protein, the fat, um, all of those things. Consumer protection policies. Uh, when you go to purchase the M&Ms, the price of them has to be on the shelf. There's a consumer protection uh, policy that says all of the prices have to be clearly marked. Back in the day, people were going around with those little sticker guns, putting stickers and price tags on things. Now it's UPC symbols, but the price has to be on the shelf so that you're not surprised when you get up to the cash register and pay for your product. Um, there are limits on advertising claims, right? We all know the uh, urban myths about the powers of different colored M&Ms, right? But M&Ms can't actually claim that. They have to follow at rules about what they can claim in their advertisements. There are patent and trademark copyright laws, right? I cannot create my own chocolate coated candy and call it M&Ms, right? It's already been taken, there's a patent, there's a trademark, I'm limited in my ability to do that. There are weights and measures. How do I know that I'm getting 10.57 uh, ounces and what does that mean and that it's consistent? Um, when I drive to go get them and I have to put gas in my car, how do I know that the gallon of gas I get from one station is the same as a gallon of gas I get from another? Because we have weights and measures and we have standards so that we are making sure that those things are consistent. There's monetary policy, right? Banking, electronic banking, paid for these with a credit card, um, uh, personal identification and all of those kinds of things that goes along with sharing that information and trying to protect your individual identification. There's agriculture policy, pricing, subsidies, maybe the peanut farmers are getting subsidies, right? There are rules about pesticides and chemicals that can be used in production, uh, lots of agricultural policies. Zoning policies, the plant where the M&Ms are made is zoned industrial. The Target store where I picked them up is zoned commercial or retail. Um, I'm presenting them to you from my house, which is in a place that is zoned residential, right? There is public works, streets and water and sewer and garbage into the plants that make the M&Ms and out, right? And there are SEC regulations. Now, uh, Mars is actually a privately held company. In fact, I, I looked up the other day that it is the third largest publicly held, or pr sorry, privately held company. It's, it's privately held, so it doesn't have to comply with SEC regulations. Um, so no Sarbanes-Oxley and those kinds of things, but that's actually a policy, right? It's not complying with that because it's privately held and we have rules that say that isn't necessary. Two pages of policies for peanut M&Ms. So I'm gonna stop there for just one second and ask Betsy if there are any questions popping up before I move on. Chris, there are no questions at this time. Okay, great, thanks. So now that we have that, you might ask that question again. 
I'm from the government and I'm here to help? Really? That's a lot, right? There's a lot going on. So how do we decide what the common good is? How do we decide how much is enough or how much is too much? Why do the questions matter? Are they gonna change in the age of COVID-19? All of this relates to the questions that we ask about what is the appropriate role of government in providing for the common good. What government does or doesn't do reflects what we value. Budgets are moral documents, right? They reflect the values of our society and what we decide is important and isn't important and what we need help providing and what we can provide for ourselves or the private sector can provide. So at the heart of the issue is really deciding how we determine the individual versus the common good and balancing it, right? Where do we feel like it's appropriate for government to step in to provide for the kinds of public safety that we might want to have, to have food safety, to have uh, public health because we have sewer systems and water that is clean and regulated, to have uh, transportation that allows us to move freely and safely, those kinds of things, uh, versus when we need to have our individual rights and the ability to make choices about to allow them to be able to have the freedom to do the things they want to do, weighing against the common good of protecting the public health and protecting our healthcare systems and healthcare workers and others um, as we move forward and navigate these new times, right? So what else do we consider when we're thinking about what is the common good? And how do we determine what we want the role of government to be, right? So one of the things that we talk about in public administration are known as the pillars of public administration. They are the values that drive or are supposed to drive our decision-making about the role of government and public policy and what's important and how we balance things, right? And those values are the four E's of public administration are efficiency, economy, effectiveness, and equity, right? So efficiency is just, are we doing things in the most efficient manner? The shortest period of time, the easiest way to get things done. Is the line short at the DMV? Can you apply for your building permit online so that it's quicker, right? Um, how many places do you have to go in order to get the services that you need? Can you do one-stop shopping or do you have to go to several different offices to get what you need, right? Economy is about getting the biggest bang for the buck, right? It's the taxpayer's money. We don't wanna be spending it willy-nilly without um, paying attention to what we're doing and wasting money on things. Uh, so we think about economy, right? Are we getting the biggest bang for the buck? And sometimes we have to trade off economy for other things. So for example, right now, uh, claims for unemployment are extremely high, right? That is costing us more than would normally be the case, but we have to be spending the money in order to make sure that people can continue to maintain their livelihoods and households and those kinds of things. 
uh, we're investing lots of money in PPE and ventilators and other things. Um, and hopefully we're, we're getting those things at an appropriate cost and they aren't being jacked up in price, but we're having to spend more money on things right now um, because of particular crisis. When we create new systems, uh, when um, the new computer systems are put into place, for example, for MinShare or uh, tracking um, vital records and those kinds of things, it costs us more in the short term because we're setting up systems that provide efficiency and effectiveness in the long term. So sometimes economy is a trade-off, but we're always trying to make sure that in the long term, we are getting the biggest payoff for the public dollar. Effectiveness is just that. Are we doing what we set out to do, right? Is the policy doing what we wanted it to do in the first place? Is it successful? And uh, sometimes there are unintended consequences or even side effects. So uh, one of the examples I often use when I talk about effectiveness is the DARE program, right? Um, the drug awareness resistance education, um, which was highly popular um, uh, 10 years back or more, and it, it still carries on. And what they found was um, in the research that the DARE program in and of itself probably wasn't doing a whole lot to reduce drug use, but what it was doing was increasing the relationship between uh, police and youth and creating benefits um, because the, of those relationships that were just as important, if not more important than the drug awareness um, education. So sometimes the effectiveness isn't what we initially intended, but it still has a positive benefit other times we find that the policies aren't as effective as we intended them to be and we need to go back and regroup and revamp and try something different. The last uh, value that we consider in the pillars of public administration is equity. And I put this picture in here to help uh, illustrate what we mean by equity in the public sec and the setting, right? So <clears throat> equality, if you look at that picture on the top left, is the idea that everyone gets the same. In a public policy setting, that's uh, public education, for example. Just basic K-12 education is, is built on a formula. Every student gets the same amount of money based on that formula. That's an equality program, right? Um, but sometimes certain populations need more. Right, so in education, uh, we provide special education becomes, because some students have learning disabilities that requires them to get more attention and more services in order to level the playing field, right? So that top uh, right-hand picture is the idea of equity. Some people get more based on needs. The Americans uh, with Disabilities Act, the ADA, is a social equity program. Some people get more, right? They get more services. We have cutouts and sidewalks. We have um, accessible buildings. We make reasonable accommodations at work in order to make sure that people that have uh, disabilities have the opportunity to participate equally in society. So that's a difference between equality and equity. And in public administration, we try to make sure that we are paying attention to questions of social equity when it's important. Questions around affordable housing, around transit, around jobs and education, all rely on um, a need to look at those questions of equity and when do certain populations need more that shows um, equality, equity, liberation, and inclusion, right? Because if you think about that picture in the first place, there's a problem because 
the people are having a barrier to be able to observe or participate in that game. Um, with equity, we at least get them to be able to view it. With liberation, we start to remove the roadblocks that were there in the first place. And with inclusion, then population is actually participating. So there are lots of different ways to look at that, but the equality and equity are important parts of our decision-making in the public administration. And policies often require trade-offs, right? Sometimes uh, we have to give up on efficiency or economy in order to get equity or uh, in order to get effectiveness, maybe we need to spend a little bit more money. So maybe economy goes out, gets lower priority in that case. There's often a trade-off between which of these four values we're going to pay the most attention to, right? Um, a prime example of this that I use uh, is about uh, public parks and parks and rec participation, right? So in order to be efficient, uh, we have created online registration for parks and rec programs in most communities, right? It's efficient, it's economical, we don't need to hire as many parks and rec employees to take registrations. You can get in online, um, but the question is, is it effective and is it hitting our equity goals, right? So if the park and rec program is really meant to do outreach and reach the widest possible population po um, available, then is online registration the best way to do it? Or do we need to reserve some slots for people to do in-person registration, right? Are we reaching the right populations with our programs if the only way that they can um, access them is through electronic registration. Same goes for the fact that government more and more now requires you to complete um, applications for licenses and permits and those kinds of things online. Do we know that all of the people that need to complete those applications have access to the internet, understand uh, the computer systems that is needed to be able to complete that work, right? So we're having this trade-off between efficiency and economy and effectiveness and equity. Are we really serving the populations that we need to serve? And the biggest question in all of this is who determines what we value, right? So we ask these questions of what is the common good versus indivi the individual good? What is the appropriate role of government? What do we value? And the question is, who gets to determine that, right? Now, uh, one of the other things that is highly important to remember is the need for cooperating for the common good, right? The most complex problems in our society um, are referred to uh, as wicked problems. There are a set of scholars, Riddle and Weber, who came up with this term wicked problems back in the 1970s, which talks about those problems that are so complex that we have a hard time actually defining them. There's no simple solution. Uh, there's all sorts of different angles and aspects to it. And um, this is the public and this is real life and we aren't in the laboratory and we can't keep testing to see what works and what doesn't work because there are real consequences to the choices we make, right? Those are the really wicked problems of our time. So there are a lots of those, affordable housing, transportation, climate change, um, lots of problems where they're complex, um, the uh, opportunity gap in the K-12 system, all of those kinds of things. And in order to address them, we really need multi-sector approaches, right? Government can't do it alone. Superheroes are not, they cannot do it alone. So it takes cooperation and collaboration across all three sectors, government, private, and nonprofit to come up to, with solutions for some of these most complex problems. This is clearly the case in COVID-19. 
if you think about all the things that are going on right now, it may feel like the government is controlling everything, but it can't do it alone, right? Um, government is putting uh, restrictions on what we can and can't do in order to try to protect the public health, but they also need businesses to participate, whether that's 3M or other man manufacturing plants, um, providing the equipment that we need between PPE and ventilators and those kinds of things, or if it's businesses cooperating with the shutdown um, with not allowing their people to come into work, with um, cooperating with those kinds of, of restrictions in order to make sure that we are continuing to protect the public health in this crisis. And the nonprofit organizations, which are having to step in and help out more uh, with food supplies and housing and helping the homeless population and other supports, uh, mental health care, um, all sorts of things that are going on that are needs in this time. There's no way to tackle these really complex wicked problems without collaboration and cooperation across all three sectors, public, private, and nonprofit. So this also has to be part of our conversation. How do we work together when we're trying to solve these problems, right? So this leads us back to those initial questions. How do we define the common good in the age of COVID-19? What is the appropriate role of government? What do we value? How do we balance the four E's, economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity? Or do we? Is that appropriate anymore or not? How much is enough? And how much is too much? When does the government overstep its bounds and into the common good? And when do we leave things for individual decisions in the private marketplace? Who will decide? Right. It's up to us, right? The citizens between voting, participation, civic engagement, all of those kinds of things. It's up to us to make sure that we play a role in deciding what we determine is the common good. And where does cross-sector collaboration make sense? We can't do it alone anymore. We can't have conversations about what the private sector can do by itself or what the nonprofit sector can do by itself or what government can do by itself. But what do we do together and where does collaboration make sense. So I lost a slide. Um, so all of these things we're going to have to consider in uh, the age of COVID-19. And actually, um, I feel fairly positive about it. I, I will say when I was working on these slides and, and redoing my presentation, um, I had five friends who lost family members to COVID-19 and uh, had just heard about the most recent one. And it was around the time when the protesters were outside of the governor's mansion asking um, asking him to open up and remove the shelter in place restrictions right and that was frustrating it was heartbreaking for me to think of um, the people who had lost loved ones um, and the people who were putting their lives at risk for us while at the same time people were asking um, for more individual liberties right but as I was doing this, I felt like we will come out of this more equipped 
to have the conversations about how we define the public good and how we define the common good. And when we decide what the appropriate role of government is and when the government doesn't need to be involved and how we collaborate across sectors. I think that we are now more prepared to have the conversations and have the insights moving forward to talk about how we define the common good. So I ask you to recognize the superheroes, those public servants who maybe aren't as invisible anymore just because we're more aware of what they're doing. Um, I know most of us don't get up and go to the bathroom and call the public works department and thank them because our toilet flushed and our showers ran and the water got taken away um, to some place to be processed. Um, but they deserve it, right? So think about the roles that public servants play in providing for the common good and making our communities safe and healthy. And hopefully the next time you go to purchase a package of M&Ms, you will never think about it in the same way again. So that being said, I'm willing to open up to questions and I will just share this last slide for a minute in case people want to contact me afterwards. But um, open up if there are any questions or discussion, Betsy, and then I'll stop sharing in a second here. Uh, there is one question. Um, any idea how much government regulations impact the price of peanut M&Ms? <laughs> um, that's a great question. And uh, n not directly. Um, I don't have that, but it, clearly they do, right? Um, because if we could uh, provide them for uh, paying people a lower wage, if we didn't have to provide as much safety in the workplace, if um, there weren't other regulations um, around production, we could probably produce them more cheaply. So uh, regulations are always going to affect the price of things. The question is, what's the trade-off? What, what trade-off are we willing to uh, make when it comes to those decisions about uh, regulations and when we want them and when we don't want to have them? A couple of new questions. Um, how has the online or remote teaching impacted how you present information to students and engage with them? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I already taught uh, online in our hybrid MPA program. So um, for me, it hasn't been a huge difference. Um, but I also teach graduate students um, and not undergraduate students. So I don't have classes three days a week. Um, and I know for my colleagues that is having a big effect on them. They're, they're having to think about new ways to present materials to keep students engaged. Um, I happen to have a son who's upstairs, he's, he's uh, in college at another university doing it online right now. Um, and uh, it's a challenge. It's, it's hard to um, stay engaged. It's hard to feel like there's a point and a purpose when you're, you're doing it all online. But I know my colleagues are working really hard um, and finding new ways to make sure that they're engaging students. So some of them are doing it with uh, direct things like this, using Zoom and, and, and Google Meet and other things to actually hold class in person and have discussions. Um, some of them are doing more videos um, and those kinds of things. Um, it is a challenge, but it's not something we can't overcome. And I think we're working to find creative ways to address the issue. Um. What types of new jobs or opportunities does Hamlin see on the horizon? Um, wow. Uh, so I can't answer for the whole university. 
I can answer for my, myself. I think there's actually going to be a lot of, of new opportunities. We talk about this all the time, right? That the jobs that um, most of us will have, not us who are edging more towards retirement as opposed to starting new in the field, but um, for a lot of our students who are graduating now, the job that they will end up in eventually don't exist today, right? We've, we've talked about this, that there's all sorts of jobs we never thought, um, you know, web designer, whoever thought you would, there would be a job that was a web designer or, or doing something like that. Um, so I think that there will be a, a lot of new opportunities um, in looking at, at kinds of things, whether, that, whether that's uh, new service sector jobs, whether it's um, other kinds of uh, creating uh, new business opportunities, those kinds of things. I just, um, I think the opportunities are endless and I also think it's hard to know because it's constantly changing. Okay. Um, within the four E's, where would you place transparency in effectiveness? And also, where would you place ethics? So um, I can answer the last one first. Ethics is the fifth E. <laughs> um, we often talk about uh, five E's and including ethics in there because it should be across all of them. Um, and uh, so that's one thing I would put in there. Um, I think transparency comes in both economy and um, effectiveness like are we doing what we really set out to do and part of the challenge with this honestly is particularly when budgets are tight what's the first thing to go program evaluation right so how do we even know that we're doing what we're supposed to do if we can't measure that and do we really want to be putting money towards measuring outcomes as opposed to actually directing uh, providing direct services right um, so I think transparency in the decision-making process, in looking at the budgets and economy and, and um, civic engagement and civic participation in those decision-making process is highly important in that. Um, and that is a challenge. It's a challenge in these times. It's a challenge and any times people are busy, um, they don't show up at city council meetings that often, unless there's something that they're really angry about. So um, those are challenges and hopefully things that um, we'll be able to work towards even more transparency and civic engagement in these kinds of decisions. Okay. What do you think about state-by-state -state policies when it comes to important things like COVID-19 stay-at-home orders? Minnesota has one, South Dakota does not or running elections, et cetera, where the federal government leaves it to each state to decide? Yeah, um, I actually think it's important. So the constitution says the federal government has certain enumerated powers and the rest are left to the states. And that is in part because our, our needs are different, right? The needs of different regions based on things like uh, density, natural resources, those kinds of things um, are different. And so having policies for everyone doesn't make sense, right? Um, we're dealing with COVID-19 in a way that's different than New York City. I mean, think about the density of New York City and how much harder that is um, to deal with than Minnesota, which is less dense and has different issues. So I think that um, states being able to provide their own policies is important. You also hope that states are making the right choices um, for their populations. And we might, may not always agree on that, but they have elected their state leaders in doing that. Um, so I think that's necessary um, in order to provide uh, safety for local governments or, or for the region in, in doing that. Okay. Um, another person says, I agree that essential workers that support the public good are heroes. However, it seems that the response from the private sector to protect these workers have been pretty limited, if not actively countered. What steps do you think we could take in the public sector with public policy to help protect and support these workers for the present situation and for the future? 
Yeah, it, um, in the present situation, I think the most important thing that we can do is to increase our testing capacity um, to be able to, um, if we're gonna get people back to work and safely and be able to open things up, we need to be able to track who is sick, do um, contact, uh, resourcing and reaching out, uh, figuring all of those kinds of things out. So having the regulations and having the support to provide the testing that's necessary to keep people safe, I think that's highly important. Um, in the long term, honestly, I'm uh, I'm hoping that I, you know I think most businesses care about their employees and um, want to make sure that they are safe and healthy and that if we provide the support necessary for them to be able to do that, um, that hopefully that will happen in the long term. Okay. Um, another person says, my wife was a special ed teacher and a problem she experienced was that when trying to provide equity to the special needs students, then the quality of the teaching goes down to many of the other students. Any thoughts on how to address this problem? Um, yeah, that's a challenge because it, it comes down to resources, right? So it's that trade-off between equity and efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and sometimes the only answer to that is more resources <laughs> um, so that you can provide the kinds of support that some parts of the population need while not uh, lessening the quality of, of what the rest of the population is getting. And, and that's, it is a challenge. And unfortunately, a lot of times it is about resources and being able to have enough support to do that. Are there other questions that people have? You can use the Q&A or the chat function to share those questions with us. Otherwise, Chris, another person says, I'm a member of the Age of Aquarius. You're the first person I've heard say Age of Coronavirus. Have you heard <laughs> that before? <laughs> Thank you and good talk. Thanks. <laughs> All right. We don't have additional questions at this time, so I think we will wrap up. Thank you so much, Chris, for participating in today's Leo lecture. And I wanna thank also Brian Johnson who helped us with the technology behind today's webinar. Thanks so much for everybody attending the Leo lecture. Our spring Leo lecture lineup has concluded with today's talk. Uh, but I also want to let you know that we are working on some Leo lectures to be happening in the next few months. So stay tuned. And you can always learn about upcoming alumni events at hamlin.edu slash alumni events. Um, I'm gonna finish my conclusion and then we're gonna go back because it looks like we have uh, a few more questions. Um, one note, you will receive a brief survey this afternoon about today's Leo lecture and I would encourage you to fill it out. That feedback is really helpful for us as we plan events like this and other types of events for Hamlin alums. So back to questions. Uh, Couple of people have said thank you. Really good program, love the slides. Um, and another thank you, great webinar. Thanks. So no questions, I saw them pop up. Um, so we will conclude. Thank you so much everyone and have a good afternoon.